Welcome to what is the 18th breakfast seminar in Singapore from Asia Research. So Forethought is an internationally acclaimed marketing advisory strategy and analytics firm that empowers brands to achieve their growth ambitions using proprietary innovative IP to model and quantify both rational and emotional drivers of consumer choice and forecast changes in market share with a high degree of predicted validity. Thank you, Piers. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for inviting Forethought to be a part of today. My only wish is that I was indeed in the room with you all. Um, Forethought first got interested in emotions in consumer choice uh, early in this century. Um, the first symposium on emotion in decision making was only in 1995. And in 2010, having done a huge amount of research to understand the current literature, we brought uh, prophecy feelings to market because we wanted to help our clients with the piece in their brand building and their uh, communications piece that was missing. We had the rational drivers of consumer choice, but we didn't understand emotion. So that's the journey I want to take you on today. Uh, and. Uh, just to, to frame this morning, two slides on forethought, very, very brief. Um, then some of the theory that got us to where we are, a little look into the methodology and a quick case study. I hope that works for you all. So um, forethought, um, we try to always bring our work um, to industry awards so that it can be assessed against our peers and so that we can learn and evolve and develop through their, their smart and useful feedback. So just some of the awards that Forethought has won in this uh, brand and communication space in the rational and emotional choice drivers. And just some of the categories that we work across, um, insurance, painting, retail, the hotel sector, banking, media, uh, quick service restaurants, wealth uh, in the Asia Pac and North America regions. Promised I'd be quick about who Forethought was. So emotions in decision making. We first became aware, uh, initially the economists had the running on how people make choice, and it was an entirely rational framework of decision making. And for, for many decades, that was the accepted base of knowledge, the advertising industry picked it up, marketers picked it up, in trying to detonate consumers' preference for our brand we understood that decision-making was entirely rational. Along comes Professor Antonio Damasio. Some of you may have read some of his work, uh, Professor of Neuroscience at the University of Southern California. And he was observing a couple of his patients who were challenged in making decisions. And what he identified was the emotions processing centers in the brain were damaged. And without that emotion, ability to process emotion, they were not able to detonate decision-making. Further down the stream, Daniel Kahneman. Now, I'm sure many of you will have read Thinking Fast and Slow. Daniel Kahneman, the first psychologist to win the Nobel Prize for economics, um, teaches us that there are two styles of, of thinking. There is system one, which is fast, effortless, associative. Um, it happens without any real cognitive effort. And then there's system two, which is like doing a maths equation. It is slow and it's effortful and it's rules-based. And that's the cognitive processing system, the rational processing system. So from these learned academics and, and many more Forethought learnt about how decision making actually occurred. Now, in the emotions piece, in, in understanding emotion in choice, any measurement tool that is applied must measure emotion implicitly. Where we measure emotion explicitly, we have to deal with an awful lot of noise. Um, for example, in a focus group setting, we can ask people how they're feeling. However, 
the data we get back is coloured by all manner of different activities, the social environment in which the, the respondent is participating, the kind of day the participant has had. And we don't get a clean read on a motion when we ask for or capture that data explicitly. So it must be implicitly measured. Any emotions measurement tool needs to be predictive of relevant consumer outcomes. Business outcomes is how Forethought defines it, such as brand choice or market share growth. It should reliably detect the discrete emotion, including negative emotions such as anger, sadness, shame, anxiety. Because as marketers, our clients must be able to address negative emotion, whether that be a, a deliberate choice to detonate a negative emotion, to, cat uh, to catalyze switching behavior, for example, or to understand what positive emotions are involved in the category choice. For example, pride. Uh, and we know that in pride, it's a very powerful emotion for retention, repeat purchase, loyalty, advocacy. So the, the, the discrete emotions need to be captured. It should incorporate social emotions, the emotions that happen around us as much as within, and it must be able to be actioned by the marketing team. They must have it in a granular way such that they can shape brand strategy informed by the emotion measurement, or communications and be able to track it so that they can see how communication strategy with the emotions element is operating in market. Do they need to dial it up? Do they need to dial it down? Is it the right emotion? How is the competition performing against our brand on that emotion? So, an emotion is our physiological response to a stimulus. For example, you'll hear a car horn go off and your heart will race a little. That's the emotion. What feeling is, is the emotion coloured in by knowledge and experience. Ah, my heart's racing. I know that's because something has just shocked me. Or if you're going into an interview, you might notice that your hands start to sweat. That's a physiological response, that's emotion. But understanding that your hands are sweating because you are feeling nervous or anxious, that's experience explaining the emotion, that's feeling. So that's the non-conscious element. Then there's the conscious, which is the ability to express or explain what you're feeling. Now, we can measure uh, non-conscious emotional states using medical uh, tools such as fMRI, EEG, galvanic skin response. Uh, facial coding seeks to get some of the emotions. Um, it, it, the, uh, our facial muscles uh, are able to provide some information, but not all information about emotion. Um, our tool uses a metaphor elicitation based on Zoltman's work from Harvard, where we uh, use um, the metaphor for each emotion in a visual depiction depiction to allow people, our respondents to play and explain how they're feeling just using imagery, because the minute we start to use words, we're triggering cognition. We avoid focus group environments to capture cognitive emotions because, as I explained earlier, there's interference. So, prophecy feelings measures right where the feelings just become explainable. We capture the data using a gamified tool and it sits within this framework. This is our brand choice framework. On the left, we have overall value, an economic utility model, price versus quality, quality is built of reputation and performance. These are really important in driving choice. Knowing underneath this, the hierarchy of drivers that affect affect how consumers are choosing is really important because we must in our brand and communications teach our marketplace something about us that helps them make a choice. 
But the emotion piece is the detonator, implicitly woven into the brand, implicitly woven into our communications and how we tell our story. But knowing which emotion is relevant in our category is absolutely critical. This is how our prophecy, thoughts and feelings um, framework looks as a model. We have the rational drivers, price, reputation, performance. And on the right, we have um, the emotions drivers, prophecy, feelings. We must make our audience feel something. We must define the emotion we want to own in our brand so that when someone sees our brand or sees our communication, that emotion is activated and we becomes a prime. So that when they're in the supermarket or when they're choosing their fast food category or they're choosing their insurance brand or their bank, when they're looking at the category, our brand has an emotion detonated when they see our brand. So just to give you a sense of the importance of emotion in different categories, it may not be surprising that um, diapers for first time mums is a highly emotional category and the emotions are interestingly love and anxiety. First time mums are very anxious to ensure their babies are comfortable and are protected and cared for. Down the other end of the scale, we have discount department stores, a highly rational decision. I have to save money. I need to buy, uh, I need some products, but I need to buy it at a, at a highly price competitive uh, level. I'm going to a discount department store. You might be surprised to learn that uh, uh, normal strength beer is an emotional choice. Low strength, low carb beer is a highly rational choice. Just a little tidbit there for you. Interesting for us, when we, we've, we've been modeling the rational drivers of choice for many, many years, um, and we were getting correlations uh, with lag third party industry data uh, of around 0.7. Once we started to model emotions versus the rational drivers of choice, the predictive validity of the models against third party industry data, lag data, three to six months, elevated to 0.8, confirming to us that understanding emotion in choice behavior is vitally important for marketers. The emotions as we measure them, just to give you a flavor, we call these like our primary colors. You, they are not binary, we don't just have an emotion. We can be feeling pride and anger all at once, but we need to be able to see those. And the way we capture them is, as I say, a game. Uh, but here we, I show you the orange data point with the high spike. That spike is a timestamp spike. So the, ver the horizontal axis is the time it takes for us to capture that data in the survey. And it's a third of a second or up to a second. If it takes longer than that, we actually um, disregard that data because emotion is so fast, we've got to capture it quickly. The rational drivers can be more cognitive, uh, sorry, um, allows more time for people to ruminate and consider. And the time it takes to capture rational responses in the survey can be up to six seconds. So, Nescafe. Nescafe came to us. Um, they wanted to relaunch the brand in a particular market and um, they wanted to understand both the rational drivers of choice and the emotion that they should be considering. So we were able to provide them with a model. This is not the genuine data, folks. I've had to mask that. You can understand to protect um, client confidentiality and their strategy. But to give you a flavor of the kinds of drivers, uh, so under price, which is 29% in choice behavior in this category, we have everyday price of the jar, price per cup. Uh, under reputation, we have, it's a popular choice. Um, being a stylish choice um, and under performance, we have choice drivers 
such as aroma of the coffee being the freshest coffee, and we have a hierarchy of effect. Underneath this, we then have uh, existing customers score on each one of these drivers versus the addressable markets perception of every brand in the category score. So we can tactically um, work out which driver Nescafe can own versus the competitors and where Nescafe can take share depending on each of these drivers. Then we have the emotion, the emotion driving category behaviour. And we sought to understand Nescafe's ability to own distinctively one of these emotions, and we embedded that into the communications strategy. I'm about to show you an animation, um, but first what we have is what we call a triple play. So we've identified the emotion. Again, um, the emotion is clear here. Nest Cafe decided that love was the emotion they wanted to activate and the, the rational drivers are masked, but we have a quality driver, sensory taste, and a price driver, well, well priced. And folks, if I can encourage you in your communications to never shy away from having a price, whether it be um, signaled or absolute, a price message in your communications, it's incredibly important. Um, People try to avoid it because they think that sends them into a price battle. We're not saying uh, advertise that you are the most price competitive. It's not about being the most price competitive, but providing pricing cues that signal your consumers are getting value, incredibly important. So here is what Forethought calls the communications triple play. This is what we want the brand and the communications to stand for in market and it informs the creative brief and how the advertising comes to market. So the creative agency received their brief using the triple play and came up with a couple of animatics. Now I'll just show you a brief moment of the mood video that was produced. Um, we tested at this point to understand which of these um, uh, animatics elicited the right choice drivers, rational, and the right emotion. Then it went to a more fully, fully realised animatic. I've been peering out a window Trying to find an outdoor To fire into the rain Hidden by the shadows <laughs> Trying to find your way home The shelter from the rain and, and so it goes on. But we have an intergenerational story, a father and a daughter from when they were uh, a young family to the more mature family. That animatic of the creative options presented to the client was the one that most effectively activated the emotion and the choice drivers. So with that level of confidence, knowing at the pre-test stage that the ad directionally was right, Nescafe was able to move forward into the full-blown execution. I've been peering out a window, trying to find an apple, far into the rain. Hidden by the shadows, trying to find your way home and shelter from the rain. This one is an art song. But what's most important for us today is to understand what effect did the, um, the emotional elicitation, nowhere in the ad does it say love us, nowhere in the ad does it even mention love, but the ad through its storytelling signals and cues love. Now, I can tell you, on the right, we've got our emotions web. On the right-hand side, the orange, yellow, purple, pink, and blue are the positive emotions. The purple emotion is actually love. On the left-hand side, we have the negative emotions, anger, sadness, shame, anxiety. At our starting point, 
we have a purple odd shaped thing in the middle of the circle. That's the Nescafe brand before the ad trying to elicit love. So the brand was not doing anything to drive positive emotion. The always animatic is the pink line in the center. And what we saw in the testing was it barely moved the dial on the emotion that we were going after. But the full blown ad always, oh, pardon me, sorry, the pink directionally tells us we're right. The animatic was directionally giving us the cue that the emotion was in the right pathway. The dark maroon line with the red arrow pointing to it is the TVC performance on love. And we can see a really significant spike. So we know that that emotion was the most important emotion driving category choice. And now we can see our brand, Nescafe, is actually activating that emotion. So a really successful outcome and it yielded results in market. Obviously, sales are the most important thing. Just some feedback from the client. Um, Nestle used the prophecy thoughts and feelings to access the rational and emotional inventory for the brand and communications. Without this approach, we would still have an insights gap. And for us, feeling was a building block of accountability, delivering predictive validity market share. So it told us what we needed to do, but it also allowed us to me measure performance in market. So that, and I'm smack on time, that's um, a, just a flavour of Forethought's approach to measuring the rational and emotional choice drivers, supporting our clients to embed that into brand and communications. Um, and thank you for your time. And I would love any questions that you'd like to fire my way. Do you have market norms for categories in the Asia Pacific region? Um, we, we do have a norms database. It's for the, uh, yeah, it could be looked at from an Asia Pacific region. Uh, basis, we, we treat it as global. So what I was just curious about is earlier you were, uh, showed us, you know, the role of emotion across many categories. Yes. Discount yes. department stores was at the bottom. And I just wonder yes. when you measured this, was this looking at the choices of brands or stores within a category or was it at mm. a higher level of saying, yeah. will I go to a discount department store versus a full price one? A really thoughtful question. Thank you. So, um, what we learned is we had the discount department stores, but we also had general department stores in, in the model. And uh, so the with general department stores in the model, it really, because our target audience was actually um, mums responsible for the household income. And they got incredibly anxious when the general department stores were in. When we took them out, the discount department stores presented a completely different emotional profile um, and we were able to model that against rational drivers and see that a store I feel financially comfortable in was connected to pride and what we know about pride is that it's uh, there's a pro-social uh, expression of pride which is I am a member I'm a part of something bigger than myself um, but there's also self-reflective I'm making good decisions for me and the people near me. Um, so, um, the, so the generally discount department stores is a, a rational decision, but you still need to detonate an emotion. And our client in that case was Kmart, um, and they were able to go after Pride, and they had previous to us coming in had generated ten years of losses and were about to be closed down. Um, the campaign that ran for 18 months on the back of this work turned the, the fortunes of the business around completely um, and, and had them in the market leading position within two years. Okay, I, I've got one question. Uh, we, we do have quite a few clients here from financial services. Yes. And it, it's, it's generally thought, at least last time I checked, that um, financial services are far more system two type of decision, far more considering mm -hmm. if it's a major a major decision like a mortgage. But is there still 
applications of your techniques for, yes. say, financial services or, or even business to business? And Absolutely, there is. You've got experience of doing that. Absolutely. Uh, so in the banking sector, uh, in insurance, in banking, uh, in wealth, um, we've certainly uh, used this very heavily. Um, so in the Australian market, we are working with one of the big four. So if you, you know that the, the Australian banks are in the top 50 banks in the world, or they were. Um, so we're working with one of the major banks at the moment. Um, the brand, the moment a, cons a consumer is choosing their brand remains a normal choice of brand, regardless that the product is, is highly rational. So the, the, the brand must address the rational elements that are going to drive preference. But to, to get a distinctive position in market, owning an emotion, and it's really interesting, um, so the, our client uh, currently is Westpac. Um, they are going after a very specific emotion. I won't explain which one, but perhaps if you look at the advertising, you'll see, um, or you'll feel it even better. Um, in the B2B space, yes, um, we're working with um, big four, a big four um, consulting firm. And they've learnt uh, both in their audit and their consulting space that people are people and decisions remain uh, and emo have an emotional element in it and that they need to address that in their communications. The communication style is different. They're not advertising, but in how they're interacting um, in their relationships, in their, in their um, collateral, in their asset, other assets, is informed by that. Thank you, Pierce.